really hot and I can't turn the fan on because you guys would hear it if it was on. So if you see me sweating during this video, um, no you don't. You're actually the one sweating and you're just projecting your insecurities onto me. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Abby and today we are going to be doing my July reading wrap up. I just got off of work and it was really busy, which means that I was pretty much talking in like my high pitched customer service voice for four hours straight. So I don't know if my voice is gonna make it through this whole video. We will see. Work was super fun today. There was a lady that came in with a knife, but it's not as bad as it sounds because every time a customer comes in with a weapon, I treat myself to a bag of candy. It's nerds, but without the mess. But you didn't come here to hear about my work day. You came here to hear about books. So let's just get right into it with the seven books that I read this July. Starting with Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. I finished this on July 2nd. It is the story of a very observant AF named Clara. AF stands for artificial friend. And Clara is living in this sort of sparsely described dystopian world. That's all the synopsis I'm really willing to give on this book because I think it is best to go in blind. This book had a massive waitlist at my library, so it took me several months to actually be able to get it and read it. And by the time I'd gotten it, I had forgotten what it was about, which ended up working out really well because once again, I think you should go in blind. I am so excited to say it. This book was my first five-star read of 2021. I'm somebody that gives out five-star reads very sparingly. Any book that gets a five star from me doesn't necessarily have to be perfect, but it has to have like that secret ingredient. It has to have that special sauce. It really just has to like put me through a whole array of emotions and leave me kind of doubled over inside. And Clara and the Sun absolutely did that for me. A couple of caveats with this though, I was seeing like two different types of people in the Goodreads reviews that were not really a huge fan of this book. And it seems that those types of people are A, either really hardcore sci-fi fans or B, longtime fans of Kazuo Ishiguro's work. This was my first book that I read by this author, so I didn't have any of like the buildup or the expectations that some other people had. I saw a lot of people saying that it wasn't as good as The Remains of Day or Never Let Me Go, which if that's the case, very loud car, which if that's the case, I'm super excited to read both of those books because I really loved Clara and the Sun. And looking into kind of the hardcore sci-fi side of things, I think most of those people were expecting this book to be presented as sci-fi and embody a lot of sci-fi tropes, but this book really is leaning more literary fiction than anything else. So I think that some of the expectations that were put on this book from that side of things were a little bit unfair and unrealistic. Not to bash any reviewers or anyone's opinions, I think they're all very valid, but I did see a very pretentious review that was talking about how science fiction is supposed to be intelligent and make people think, and this book didn't do that for them. Um, for one thing, I disagree, it made me think quite a bit. And B, maybe that is why I don't like reading sci-fi, because because this is the type of attitude surrounding all of the books. We have to be intelligent all the time. No. <laughs> but regardless of the sort of mixed reviews that this book's been getting, I absolutely loved it. I found it to be really creepy, but also heartwarming and hopeful, and it was super gripping. There's really no part of the story that I can remember not liking. I truly enjoyed the entire experience from page one to page like 300 something, whatever. And if I had to narrow everything down to tell you what the best thing about this book is, I would say that the perspective is everything. The protagonist has just such a unique voice and she views the world completely different from any protagonist I've ever read before. I just thought that Clara's point of view was such a delight to read and I am so excited to read through the rest of Kazuo Ishiguro's stuff. The next book I read was The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave. I finished this on July 5th. This story follows a woman named Hannah who's been married for one year when her husband just disappears. The only thing he leaves behind is a note to Hannah that says the words protect her. This being in reference to his 16 year old daughter, Hannah's stepdaughter who Hannah does not really get along with. There's a bit of a, a wall there. So Hannah is suddenly tasked with like forging a relationship with this stepdaughter and then also figuring out what is going on with her husband, who her husband really was, etc., etc. To me, this book really was just a breath of fresh air. It's, I believe that it's categorized as a thriller. I think it's leaning more mystery than thriller, to be completely honest. But either way, it had this confidence to it that I honestly don't see a lot of in like the thriller mystery suspense area. Because so many thrillers kind of depend on like twists and surprises, I oftentimes feel kind of like a sense of insecurity with those books because they're trying so hard to stand out in a genre that's 
quite frankly, very crowded. And it's very easy for authors to rely on like thriller gimmicks and tropes. And don't get me wrong, sometimes I love a good gimmicky thriller. But this book just stood really tall and confident in its plot. It was just very straightforward, direct, it gave you what you came for, and that was it. That said, I did feel like it kind of lacked an emotional punch, particularly with the relationship between Hannah and the stepdaughter Bailey. And I think that this is mostly due to the fact that Hannah and Bailey are not super unique characters. Bailey especially is kind of built on like the angry teenager stereotype and it made it kind of difficult for me to believe this relationship or root for it to be completely honest. But I give it four stars because I think it's a strong book Maybe not a super memorable one, but it did what it came to do. And once again, I really appreciate the confidence with which this story was told. The next book I read was Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller, which I finished on July 11th. There was a bit of a gap between the last thing he told me and Unsettled Ground, and I will explain that gap in a minute. Unsettled Ground is about a woman who dies and leaves her adult twins in a position of both squalor and complete and total ignorance. These twins have been living with their mother their entire lives, even though they are now in their 50s. And once their mother is dead, the twins realize that their mother has lied about a lot of things, which uh, puts them in some pretty bad situations. So before I continue, I have a question for you. Are you too happy? If so, I would highly recommend this book. It will strip you of all excess joy and then some. It is very claustrophobic and depressing and I had a very hard time getting through it because even though it's well written and very atmospheric, you just want to be done and yet it just keeps going. It's not a particularly long book, but it does not make itself easy to read at any point. And with that, I don't just mean that it's depressing, it also just doesn't give you a whole lot of incentive to keep reading because it is very much a character-driven book and every and all of the plot elements just kind of randomly happen. So you can't really follow like a, okay, I feel like I'm in the rising action right now and we're heading towards the climax. Like those rules don't really apply to this book. I think that it is really well written and it certainly opens up a lot of conversations around motherhood and familial bonds. But ultimately with my rating, I had to consider my own enjoyment and I just didn't love this book. So I ended up giving it three stars. The next book I read was Anxious People by Friedrich Bachmann, which I finished on July 15th. If you don't already know, Anxious People is about a bank robbery turned hostage situation. The story is both unfolding in real time and also through police interviews that are happening after the fact. If you had never heard about this book before and you're hearing this now and being like, ooh, sounds fun, sounds like thrillery, exciting, all that, um, make no mistake, this is not an action book. It is a character study. There are some like mystery elements to keep you going, but it's primarily literary fiction. This was my first ever Friedrich Bachmann book, and I didn't really know what to expect other than to adore it, basically, because Friedrich Bachmann has such a devoted because Friedrich Bachmann has such a devoted following and everybody says that his books are just amazing and life-changing and, you know, all of the accolades go to him. I did find this book to be very clever. I thought that the control of the narrative was just superb. It was just amazing. But this book makes itself very hard to love. And I'll tell you why. The book is called Anxious People, but if I were the one writing it, I probably would have retitled it with um, Unsufferable People or unrealistic people. As you probably gathered from the intro, I work a customer service job. I see the absolute worst that humanity has to offer. I fight over coupons with people of all races, genders, ages, and backgrounds, pretty much all walks of life. I have seen them and they've been awful to me. I'm also a very introverted person. Whenever I have any major social interaction, I need a good eight hours of recuperation. So one would think that I have a relatively negative opinion on the human race at large. And I don't necessarily think I have a positive one, but I have to say, anxious people made me question whether I was living in like an idyllic bubble where people are just generally better than they are in the rest of the world. Because the entire time I was reading anxious people, the only thought I could really have was just People don't act this bad. <laughs> it really did feel like when Friedrich Bachmann went to write this book, he first went on Twitter and saw one of those posts that was like, characters need to be flawed to be good. And he was like, oh yeah, 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 flawed characters, flawed characters, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he just put all of his energy into that and then also like amazing plotting and execution and all that. I'm fully aware that it's not really a book where you're supposed to like all of the characters. like. I'm not here for that. I'm just saying people are not that insufferable. They're not that rude. They're not that obnoxious. 
it just felt like I was dealing with a bunch of like caricatures and like all the same one too because they all had such this because they all had super over the top reactions to everything and like the same level of over the top. They felt like cast members in a play meant to make you hate humanity. The cat is right outside my door begging to be let in. No, because you'll bite my feet. You're fine. He's not my cat, he's my roommate's cat. I'm not like blocking him from his food or litter box or anything like that. Anyways, I really respect a lot of what this book did. However, my enjoyment level was not super high on this one either because I just could not believe a single one of the characters. So I gave this three stars. The next book was The Drowning Kind by Jennifer McMahon? McMahon? Mc McMahon? By Jennifer McMahon? McMahon? I don't know how much I'm supposed to like give over to that H. Jennifer Mick McCone. That's too intense. Jennifer Mick May Mick Mick Mahan. No, but it's a hone. Mick Mahan. Jennifer Mick Mahan. The next book I read was The Drowning Time by Jennifer McMahon. This book I finished on July 16th. This book is about a social worker named Jax who has a older sister named Lexi who has been through some hard times, uh, particularly with her mental health. At the beginning of the book, Jax finds out that her sister Lexi has died in the house that she inherited from her grandmother, and Jax has to go there to arrange the funeral and figure out what exactly to do with all of Lexi's possessions and also figure out what exactly happened to Lexi because there are certainly some spooky things afoot. I had been excited for this book but not to a crazy extent. I picked it up one morning, I was gonna have to leave for work that day around like four o'clock. It was like late morning and I was like, you know, we'll read for like an hour, we'll light a candle, we'll have some tea. It'll be a nice relaxing morning before I have to go in for work. So painting the picture here, I sat down to read for an hour. This book made me late for work because I would not put it down. And luckily I was able to finish this book right before I left, uh, which is a good thing because I don't think I would have been a functioning staff member had I still been thinking about this book. Which I was, but like at least it was in the we finished it and we're not like thinking about what's to come. At the beginning of the year I was kind of on this like quest to find a book that made me feel the way The Haunting of Hill House, the show, makes me feel. And I had kind of given up on that because I had read the book Watch Over Me by Nina LaCour earlier in the year thinking that that was going to like give me the Haunting of Hill House vibes. So when I picked up The Drowning Kind I didn't think that it was going to like feel like the Haunting of Hill House but it did and oh my gosh. Like, I'm genuinely not kidding when I say I think that Mike Flanagan needs to read this book and, like, pick it up for the third season of the Haunting of Hill House franchise. Like, genuinely. <laughs> this is, like, like, it has everything he wants. You've got Easter eggs and generational trauma. There's two timelines. There's a creepy secluded village in Vermont. It's perfect. It's so atmospheric and psychological and just, oh, beautiful. Loved it. It was such a page turner for me and I don't often do this period but I especially don't often do this for like horror books or thriller books or you know every, anything in that vein but I gave this book five stars. I just I loved it so much it just mm, it just grabbed me wouldn't let me go and I had such a fantastic time reading this book and I'm so excited to read more from this author because I think we are going to get along fantastically. The next book I read I actually still have the copy of and that is Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. Can everybody just be proud of me for a second? This sticker is on the outside of the cover and I could very easily pick it off but I was like this is a library book we're not gonna pick off their stickers and I resisted the urge and I didn't do it. It was really really hard. I like you can, I don't think you can see it, but I did start picking at it, but I was like, no, 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 no. This is a library book. We have to respect it. 
I had initially gotten this book because my roommate and I decided we wanted to do like a buddy read situation, which proved to not be super successful. I pretty much only read physical books because when it's an audio, I don't really pay attention, but my roommate pretty much only does audiobooks. So we were reading this in different forms and whenever I would ask her what part she was at, she would tell me like, oh, I'm at hour four. And I'd be like, okay, that means nothing to me, but thanks anyway. Miracle Creek is a courtroom drama following an explosion that happened at a facility designed to cure autism, cerebral palsy, and infertility. This book is incredibly well written. I think pretty much every single comment that you see on Goodreads for this book starts with people saying, I had no interest in reading a courtroom drama or like a courtroom thriller. I didn't care. That wasn't the setting that I wanted to read. Um, and Angie Kim really turns around all of those opinions so fast with just her amazing writing. It's super engaging and it paints the picture of so many different characters so vividly. Hi guys, it's Editing Abby. I don't really like how this section came out, so I'm just going to go ahead and redo it here. Um, this book is incredible, but it deals with a lot of characters that you're meant to sympathize with sparingly but never support. Uh, simply put, there are some very bad eggs. There is a lot of ableist language in this book, which not only makes the book hard to recommend, but also hard to read at times. Once again, a lot of the ableism in this book is coming straight from the bad egg characters, but I did feel like more could have been done to refute some of the harmful misconceptions about autism that were perpetuated by the characters. So I gave this book four stars instead of five. And way to go me, saying all of my thoughts in one minute instead of the 10 minutes that it took me when I first film the video. But it is a really strong book and I would not at all be surprised if it ended up being in my top 10 books of the year because once again just amazingly well written. Now for the last book on the list I'm going to have to tread lightly because this book has quite the intimidating fan base. On July 27th I finished Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid and if you are particularly militant in your love for Taylor Jenkins Reid I would just go ahead and sign off now because I didn't love this book. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. But I think that there's some serious issues with it. And to be honest, I'm surprised I haven't seen more people be disappointed in it. Anyway, Malibu Rising follows the four children of superstar Mick Riva, who I've never read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, but I did kind of piece together from some of the comments on the Goodreads page that Mick Riva was one of the husbands, and this is kind of like a spin-off-ish of like that Evelyn Hugo world. This book is mainly focusing on this big annual bash that these four siblings throw every year. The first half of the book is pretty much the siblings just getting ready for this big party, and also flashing back to like their childhoods, and then the second half is the party itself. And this is not just any party where it's like, you know, a couple of your friends from high school come over. This party attracts celebrities, this party attracts all notable Malibu locals. It truly is the party of the year. Now, I was really enjoying this book for the first half of it. It was very easy for me to see why Taylor Jenkins Reid has the book community in a chokehold. Her work is just compulsively readable. I was just flying through this for the first half. Taylor Jenkins Reid also understands her reader's just fascination with fame very well because because she knows what everyone's here for and it's to hear about famous people and she delivers on that. But once we get into the second part of this book, a big issue gets illuminated and once you see it, it's really hard to move past it in my opinion. And this issue is mainly that we spend the first half of the book having these flashbacks and seeing the main characters as children, seeing where they came from. And mild spoiler, they don't have a very easy childhood, particularly their, particularly their teenage years are really tough. But then of course we're seeing them in the present when the oldest is 25 and the youngest is 20. Minor gripe with this book, I felt like all of the characters should have been older. There's just a huge disconnect from who these characters are as children and teenagers to who they are in the present. Mainly because as teenagers they are in a position of poverty, but in the present they're all doing very well for themselves to the point where they're living in this giant mansion and having this massive party where they're inviting all of these celebrities and it's like the book does kind of explain how they were able to move from a position of poverty into where they were now, but that explanation really did not do it for me, mostly because it was just very unrealistic. The oldest sister, Nina, starts modeling and she pretty much instantly becomes famous through modeling. Her younger brother, her younger brother starts surfing, immediately becomes a professional surfer. We don't really get any background to 
we don't really hear a whole lot about how he actually made that happen. We very abruptly went from them being teenagers struggling to make it by to them being like famous without any sensical bridge between the two. And you might be thinking, well, you said they were the children of a superstar. Clearly they're doing okay. Um, they not only don't get any help from their dad, they also are not really using his name to get anywhere. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it did kind of feel like Taylor Jenkins Reid was in a position where she felt like she didn't know how to not write about famous people. And I don't want to put that assumption on her. I'm sure she's a very versatile writer, but just based on what I do know of her books, fame is like a main component of all of them. And it just, in this case, I was like, they, why are they famous? Most people that, like, just because you decide to be a model does not mean you're going to be famous. Most models really struggle a lot to like get their names out there, get recognition, and get paid. <laughs> I just felt like I was introduced to the set of characters in the beginning and they kind of just went away for the second half because there was just no connection that made sense. The second part of this book also has everything and the kitchen sink in it. We are introduced to about a billion different side characters that don't have really any meaning towards the plot, which I understand is meant to establish this atmosphere of chaos at the party, but it just got so irritating. I felt like there was a really strong sense of like confidence and focus in the first half of the book, but as soon as the party actually started, it all went out the window and everything just started feeling so random and like shock value-y. And honestly, there's only so many times you can hear about people doing coke in somebody else's house and it gets boring. Like I just had very little incentive to keep reading with the second half because it was just a bunch of people I didn't care about making making stupid decisions until eventually the house gets set on fire. And listen, in the synopsis and also in the very first page, it talks about the fact that the house is going to go up in flames by the end of the night. It talks about that, you know about that, that's something you're supposed to be like anticipating. Listen, if you go into this book being excited about the fact that the house is going to catch on fire at the end, you need to not be excited or else you will be so disappointed like I was. I'm not even gonna bother spoiling how that happened because like, it's not even, like, it wouldn't even be exciting to tell you. It's honestly one of the biggest letdowns. I really do feel like the whole house getting set on fire at the end thing was added into this book purely so they could talk about it in the synopsis and like draw in a couple of like mystery thriller readers who like hadn't previously been reading Taylor Jenkins Reid. It just ends up feeling really sloppy and half-baked. And I gave this three stars because once again, I really did enjoy the first half of the book and I, and I can absolutely see why people are so in love with Taylor Jenkins Reid, but I just found the last half of this book really not fun. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching. Those were the seven books that I read in the month of July. I am going to be moving at the end of August, so I don't know how that'll end up affecting any of like the videos that I have planned for the future, but fingers crossed that it won't completely derail them and I will get to see you guys in a timely manner. If you're not subscribed, please do that. You could also like, you could also leave a comment. Any type of engagement really helps me out. And if nothing else, I will see you in September for my August reading wrap up, but hopefully I'll be able to see you before then with some other videos that I have planned, provided moving goes smoothly.